Good morning and welcome to Breakthrough Walls. I am Ken Walls and I'm your host. And today I have an amazing guest by the name of Mark Fournier. And Mark is a three-time Emmy Award winning filmmaker and um, a coach and a leader and a real life rock star. And you guys are going to love the story. So do me a favor and share this out right now. Go ahead and share it and hang on because this is going to be a great ride. Here we go. And we are back. Let me bring Mark on. Mark, welcome to the show. Good morning. Happy Wednesday. Thanks Happy for having me. Wednesday. Yeah. So, Mark, I um wow, we have a lot of mutual um friends and connections and Melody Meyer introduced us. You reminded me this morning. Um yeah, great which job. is She's amazing. Awesome. She's amazing. Yeah. And we know that one guy, that chicken soup guy, what's his name? Mark. Oh, that Mark, Mark Victor, dude. He's a, yeah, the <laughs> other Mark. That's what we call, that's what we, what I say when we're together. I go, he, he calls me Mark one and I call him Mark two. I go, cause you're older <laughs> than me. Technically, you should be Mark one. <laughs> he is awesome. I love him and Crystal. But so, so I started this show, it's been over four years ago. I've interviewed over 460 celebrities and entrepreneurs. And, um, you know, it's it, honestly, it was because I was stuck in life and I thought, you know what, if I just start interviewing people, I'll figure my stuff out. And I did, I did. So, um, oh my God. you know, <laughs> I know. It, it, it worked out for Napoleon Hill. I know. Right. <laughs> I didn't even think about that, but but that's true. So, so Mark, I, you know, I love hearing where people started. So let's start with where you were born and raised. Oh, my gosh. Uh, okay. I was born and raised. Uh, I, I'm glad you didn't say where, where did you grow up because I don't think I've done that part yet. I'm working <laughs> on it. <laughs> but uh, I was born in the infamous Flint, Michigan. Uh, known, unfortunately worldwide for its um uh, unsavory water <laughs> i was gonna say man you look okay you look all right for having you know, drank for, all that nasty water <laughs> fortunately uh that actually only affected a little part of the town of the city itself and we were out in the out in the sticks out in the rural area uh yeah. and i really spent uh, much of my time in a little town called benton michigan which is no a, way. it's a, it's a lake in community Pardon? I have a friend that lives in Fenton. Okay, well then, uh, they're, they're wow. probably pretty happy to be there instead of in Flint. And you know, and Flint's yeah. coming back, and that's nice for them because I still have relatives there. My sister and brother-in-law, uh, Debbie and Nick, wow. still live there. And, uh, yeah, anyhow, right. so uh, yeah, so born in Flint, Michigan, on um, Star Wars Day, uh, May the Fourth be with you. So, <laughs> in nineteen fifty-seven. <laughs> wow. Wow, and, uh, 57? So, yeah, yeah I just 57? hit 65 a couple of months ago. I'm being bombarded by all the retirement uh, emails and uh, Dude, Medicare. Dude, you're 65? <laughs> yeah, in, in, two, with, in two months. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Uh, I'll take that. Uh, I accept it. <laughs> Maybe I need to go drink some water in Flint, Michigan. <laughs> oh, that's great, yeah. But you might turn green. Uh, you know, but then you get all muscled up. So, you know, and, so, yeah. Funny. Wow. so yeah, I stayed in Michigan uh, until uh, I graduated uh, high school in 1975, where um, you see in Flint, everybody goes straight to the factories. That's what they did back then. It was there was the Chevy plant and Buick and the yeah. AC spark plugs. And you just graduated and went, you didn't, they didn't go to college. I mean, I can't say 
no one did, but there was a large contingent just went straight to the factories and they were making more money right out of the gate because of all the unions and so on than right. a lot of kids were making after four or even six years of college. So, uh, but, uh, but the idea was you had a ceiling. You could only go so far if you worked in the factory. And so I was voted, uh, immediately voted most likely to succeed when I told them I'm leaving town. <laughs> <That's all laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're like, you qualify. You no, win. Of course, if anybody from Flint watches this, I, I'll never hear from them. They won't be inviting me to my reunion, my high school reunion after this. <laughs> that is too funny. Oh, well. yeah. <laughs> you said, oh, well. A long time ago. What's that? Uh, you said, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, yeah. So, God. so there you go. I spent a long time getting you from uh, from from birth to uh, uh, to uh, leaving school, although uh, probably one of the more interesting aspects of uh, for somebody who has a breakthrough walls show is the fact that um, my stepdad didn't believe in paying uh, I, the IRS. And so um, my um, when I was 17 years old, I came home to uh, find our house uh, home from school one day to find our house up for auction. Our car is being hold, hauled away, and uh, my mom in the front yard crying. And uh, the uh, IRS took everything. My folks left town. My stepfather was pretty abusive, so I chose not to go with them. Ended up wow. living in a car, uh, in an attic, a basement, anything I could do to finish school. And uh, stayed there until uh, I graduated and then headed out to Phoenix so I could study architecture and uh, design and some other interesting things, but so, so you, yeah. you went to college so, then. So uh, yeah, and I did go to school and uh, and started at Scottsdale, and eventually did it in bits and pieces. While I was at Scottsdale, I started a company, and uh, and it took off. I was designing uh, machines that printed uh, textiles and doing T-shirt screen printing, and had a design company that turned into a film company, uh, film production company, and uh, built an ad agency around that. But the whole time, my second love was personal development. Speaking of Napoleon Hill, when I was 12, my mom handed me Think and Grow Rich and Psycho-Cybernetics by Maxwell Maltz. Maxwell, and yeah. I just fell in love with the human condition. The very first CD or first uh, audio. No, it was a record I bought was uh, um, Earl Nightingale's um, The Strangest Secret. And it was, wow. I still have the record. And, Do uh, you really? I have the original record. I get goosebumps when I think about it. I That's still, worth I, like $17 million now or something. It probably is. In fact, I actually ended up buying one that was almost, it was like uncirculated because I thought that wow. thing's probably, uh, I've, I've got to frame it and put it up on my wall. But uh, then I bought the cassette when they came out until that wore out and broke. And But I was hooked. And so... Throughout my teens, I was reading everything I could get my hands on, attending any events I could. I went to um, uh, the Silva Mind Control uh, for for nearly a month. I, I mean, anything I could do. And so by the time I graduated high school, I was stepping up on stages and uh, doing seminars and so on at uh, 19 years old. And uh, I so... So I had two careers. I had my marketing and film production career uh, running, my screen printing, all of that running, and my personal development career running and doing seminars and started writing books and and, and so on. So there you go. I so, guess we're done. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming on. It's been a great uh, interview. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we're not done. We we aren't getting through all that that easy. So um, it's it's interesting that we have incredibly similar paths um, outside of I, I, I didn't get on stage at, at, at 19. It was many years later. Um, but, you know, I, I think that I, I always like to dig a little bit deeper. Um, I went through the stepfather abuse, all of that stuff, too. And, mm -hmm. and I think I think about um you know, I because I look back at for many, many years, I lived with this chip of resentment on my shoulder. Right. And 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 eventually I learned that's not healthy. But but, you know, 
I, I think about like your situation. Do you feel like there was any one or any event or events that, that kind of influenced the, the, the path that you took in, um, in personal development? Well, uh, I, yeah, it's a great question, Ken, because, uh, you know, what, what's the spark? What, what moves yeah. us in that direction? And in my case, um, uh, my mom was very aware of the abuse. And I mean, not the physical side, but she was aware of the emotional abuse and so on. And in those days, you know, th there was no such thing. They didn't use the word abuse. Uh, right. It was basically, um, oh, my stepdad's an asshole. <laughs> right, that, right. that was code word for abuser abuser right 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 like, oh, yeah, my, dear, my dad's a jerk too um uh, but you didn't think about abuse much less calling child protective services i mean i don't even no. know if it existed in those days uh, and if it did we sure didn't know about it no my mom was, do you, go ahead and ask you so you you know i mean <laughs> you didn't think those thoughts you just thought you know he's an asshole you just stayed away from him um <laughs> So, uh, I mean, I actually, my, one of my Emmys was for a project, uh, it's called, uh, uh, well, it had, ended up with several words. It started out as a short called the attic and because I used to hide in the attic and it was kind of a little, uh, fundraising public service ad about child abuse and, um, and mostly the, uh, the effects of psychological abuse over physical, you know, you know, you break an arm. I mean, I mean, if you know, if you got an arm broken, it heals in six weeks if you're a kid. But if you have your heart broken, that can be the rest of your life. Self-image, wow. uh, self-worth, and struggling to to prove yourself, and so on. And so then it expanded into uh, so, something called angry words, and uh, it starts out with "Dad had a bad day," and it's on, it's on the internet, and, uh, wow. and and so it's the kid again hiding in the attic, and Dad's looking for him. He's pissed off. And he's searching the house to find this kid. And that was me, man. <laughs> and so my mom, wow. uh, she had uh, she had cancer. She was always dealing with issues. Her insurance was through his uh, his company. And uh, and it was, you know, you just say, well, get out. Well, you know, there's a reason why, uh, why battered women uh, stay. And there's a reason why abuse endures. So um, her way of helping us get out was, something that became a theme for my life. And that's, I teach both empowerment and enlightenment uh, and you know, not the woo woo kind. It's really, uh, my definition is empowerment is giving, is having uh, the ability to influence the world around you. And that's powerful. And she wanted us to have that power, but enlightenment is, is 10 times bigger because it's the ability to influence the world within. Mm. And so she wanted to give me those, yeah. uh, uh, the, the, the mindsets, of course, that word uh, phrase didn't exist back then, but that's what she was teaching me was how to develop first a survival mindset and ultimately a mindset of thriving and, and of being able to take control of my <clears throat> my states and so on. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. So it was really her way of protecting us from my stepdad and my real father, who was um uh, had no use really for kids. And, and so um, he wasn't abusive. He just didn't care. And, and you know, we used to do something with uh, child abuse. It was, we had these billboards that said, the opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. And that, you know what? I, I, yeah. I, I got to tell you something, man. What you just said, Grant Cardone literally said that on, on, on a he live. Me. I, I, yeah. I said, what do you do Pardon. about. You know, how, how do you deal with hate or something like that? And he's like, you know, uh, uh, hate's not really the opposite of love. It's, 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 you know, if I, if I, if I really don't like you, I'm, I don't care. Like it's, I'm indifferent. Like, I, I love that dude. I absolutely love that. Very cool. Yeah. I believe me sitting in your seat would be a, a an amazing, I, I, I think you, you chose the, the quintessential career. And I mean, I can't think of anything that'd be more exciting than just talking to amazing people. Uh, of course, indirectly putting myself in that category on my well, show. No, you're in, you're hey, you're in it, dude. You're in it. So, and you, you, <laughs> but you, you know, my yourself. myself notwithstanding, with uh, amazing people, <laughs> and, and uh, that would be incredible. So yeah, so indifference. So my mom was aware of both the indifference from my real father and then my stepfather. Both were alcoholics. 
and she was aware mm -hmm. of that and and she was working two shifts and uh, and she just knew that the only way she could help us uh through this was to give us these uh the skill sets and and i teach that as a parent you only have three jobs and it's one is to keep your child safe uh obviously that's you know teach them not to cut their little sister's eyelashes with sharp scissors <laughs> <laughs> You know, play hopscotch in the uh, on, you know in the middle of the road and so on. Um, and number two is to teach them to uh, survive on their own when they're gone, so that when they launch, they stay launched. Yeah. <laughs> we won't get into whether that's been working lately or not. Uh, oh. And I love all my millennial and uh, Gen Z uh, 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 clients. <laughs> and then number three is to love them unconditionally, a and. Then I teach that once your children have launched, then it's just one, love them unconditionally. The rest of the lessons they get to learn on their own. They get to figure out now based on the foundation you've given them, how to uh, create a successful life. And hopefully some of those folks are watching your shows and, and of course, how to stay safe and so on. And yeah. so that was her version of teaching me um, how to make it on my own was, uh, and how to stay safe, of course, was by giving me these tools. And so it didn't take long before I was using them in my life and using them to deal with uh, my stepdad and my real father and and the issues that came up around that. And, and of course, ultimately, being on my own at 17, um, I got to put those skills to work. And it's, it's something that I'm sure you're very well aware of. We can, you know, where they say knowledge is power. I go, well, not really. It's only the consistent application of knowledge that yep. evolves into power. It's potential. Knowledge is potential power. And, yeah. and so uh, I, my coaching clients, um, I tell them during our coaching call every week, I say, you know what? This is the least important thing that we'll do this week. This information will be nothing, mean nothing to you. Certainly in, in six months or six years from now, unless you 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 drive it into your life. And so I'm a mastery guy. And so I say, these are your assignments. And that's the important thing. Go apply this to your life. Next week, I want you to come back and tell me what you did with it, how it applied, what you learned from it. And those are the things that will not only change your life right away by applying it, but also that's how you're going to master this stuff. So I had a chance throughout my teens to apply these insights on a daily basis uh, hiding out for my stepdad and so on and so forth. So, that, you know, it, it wasn't an instant um, paradigm shift. It was a gradual realization that, wow, this is where it's all happening. This is where the power is. Hope you know, that answers your question. My, my, my favorite spiritual author, hopefully Mark Victor Hans is not watching, um, <laughs> I'm kidding, because uh -huh. he's deeper than, than that, but is Dr. Wayne Dyer. And, and, yeah. you know, in my mm -hmm. first, he's amazing. And, 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 you know, in my first book I wrote, um, that pain, and I think I got it from Dyer. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, but pain is the predecessor of all wisdom. And, and there was somebody way smarter than me, maybe, you know, one of those really super famous old guys, but um, said that the greatest disservice we do to our children is to steal away their hunger. And, and I think about that, like, you know, I have two daughters and I'm like, I hate to see them go through any kind of painful situation. Right. And, and I, 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 I try to protect them from any catastrophic decisions. Super dad, Ken to the rescue. <laughs> hey, right. You want to, man, you want to protect and save and, and, and all of that. But, you know, I, I think, and, and I'm, I'm coming back to your story because when you go through the level of pain, because that's painful, man, hiding out in an attic, scared to death for your life as a little kid is freaking yeah. painful. And, yeah. and, and it, it leaves a mark, right? And, and no pun intended. And, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Um, so, you know, I really think that it's that pain that has driven you 
to the levels of success and, and, and everything else that you've accomplished in your life. That's only my personal opinion because I've been through it too. I get it. I can relate to it. Oh, Ken. Yes. I, it's obvious that you have, I, I can hear it, hear it in between in, in, in the, in the, the, the pauses and, uh, and breaks of, and absolutely. In fact, um, it, my life is kind of, I break it into two significant um, eras. And, and the first half was, was the pain and suffering. Of course, that's uh, something that, you know, Wayne Dyer would allude to. It's, um, you know, I mean, Buddhism, uh, you know, life, life is, uh, is pain and suffering. Um, uh, the first line in um, The Road Less Traveled, uh, life is difficult. Life is difficult. I didn't read that book for years because I thought, well, I don't want to read that. That sounds really That's dark negative. and depressing. <laughs> and then years later, I was like, well, you know, he's right. It is difficult. Damn. <laughs> so, okay, I guess I'll read it. And then, of course, you realize, why is it important to know that it's difficult and pain and suffering? It's, once you accept it and embrace it, it's like going through the five stages of grief. You get to acceptance. And it's like, oh, okay, well, what's wrong with difficult? Hey, my gosh, right. how many people start a company knowing it will be difficult? How many sports have you played knowing that it would be difficult? Marathons have been run. We're not opposed to difficult. We just don't like difficult to happen when we didn't ask for it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or we had other plans. <laughs> exactly. So once you learn how to take the difficult things that life has in mind for you and put it in the same category as the ones that you take on for yourself, oh my gosh, then everything turns around and, and yeah. you stop being the victim. So so the first half mm -hmm. of my life, I was in the victim state. It's life is difficult. And it's a lot of work. And it's crazy. And I was going to prove myself and prove to the world that I could do something. Of course, the whole school found out that we lost everything. They took our house. I was living in a car. And so I was poor. I was beyond poor. Um, and, and I I believed the thought that uh, I need to be uh financially successful. I need to make a lot of money and all the trappings that go with it to prove to the world that I'm okay. And yeah. so that's the first half of my life. And I was very fortunate. And I, I reached that level at some point in my life once I got into my later 30s. And it was all there. I, I had the life that few people can even dream of. And guess what happens? You get used to it. And one day you wake up and it's like, you know, the, uh, you have a six car garage and, but no place to park your sailboat. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it's like, you know, we need a bigger house. And, and, and then you buy, have a second house and it's like, you know what, oh, that second house is so much, you know, so much work. We need somebody, uh, we need a guest building uh, for a caretaker so they can watch it while we're gone. And, but then there's always October, whether you're in, in, in Chicago uh, October sucks. Arizona, it's still hot. So you've got to have your, you know, your October getaway. There's no end to it. Right. And, and well, so everybody got, needs um, a place in Hawaii though, too. Right. Mark? Well, yeah. And, and Hawaii's nice year round. And I, actually I did actually, I had, I, I had a, a school in, uh, on the big Island, uh, in Kau, wow. and I would fly out there four times a year to, um, train my instructors and keep them up to date. You know, I needed to do that in person. Well, yeah. <laughs> and then, and here's the irony. You mentioned that, uh, of course, Wayne Dyer had his place on, on Maui, but yeah. you mentioned yeah. that. And ultimately I was complaining about Hawaii. It's like, Oh, it's, it's, you get, you get Island fever and it's really kind of boring. There's that you can only look at the, at the black sand so many times. And after a while, the sea turtles aren't all that exciting. And, <laughs> and then it's like, that's a long flight to go so, so when, as long as we keep looking at the world around us, except uh, believing the thought that I need that world to be all these things in order to be happy and fulfilled, there's no end to it. And so that's where the second half of my life came was once I reached that and found out I was still not really truly happy uh, and wound up going through a five and a half year divorce because I wasn't happy in that life. Uh, and um as painful as it was, and I knew it would be, I, I knew that it was not going to be an easy process. Um, and so I decided before going into it that this would be a learning experience for me. I thought, you know what? Uh, we cannot truly grow in a vacuum. You can't build muscle in a, in a weightless environment. You got to have gravity 
to, to do that. And so I thought, okay, I will come out on the other side of this somehow uh, a better human being. And that's where the shift occurred. So after it was over and, you know, we spent a fortune on everything and uh, uh, I wound up in, in uh, compromised living conditions <laughs> that looked a little bit like my first, the, the, the earlier part of my life. And so I said, it wasn't like the Hawaii thing. No, no, that came later. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. And, and at that point, I figured it out. And so um, I stopped coaching people on how to make a lot of money and started saying, listen, if that's the only reason you called me, then I'm not your guy. And they're mm. like, yeah, but I heard that you did this for that guy and that. And I said, yeah, yeah. And I can, I'm sure that I can show you how to make all the money you need. I'll make sure you make enough to pay for my coaching fees, so I'll be free. <laughs> but if that's all you're looking for, right? I'm not your guy, man. And so I became a balance coach. I mean, I refer to myself as a life mastery and peak performance coach, uh, but my mm -hmm. moniker is the limitless coach because yeah. uh, the lessons I teach about the limitless mind and how that creates limitless potential for us. Uh, but uh, for me, it's uh, financial security is only one out of ten critical areas of your life. And, and if you think that that's enough, I can tell you right now, I, you could be a trillionaire, but if your daughter's dying of uh, some incurable disease and your wife's cheating on you and you're, uh, you, you, you've you been given three months to live yourself, I, you can be worth a hundred trillion. It's not going to matter. So, it it, you know, it goes back off. Yeah. Steve, Sorry, Steve I rambled on there. What's yeah, that? I'm, Steve Jobs wrote a letter, or gave a speech when he was like, it, do, it doesn't, it really, truly doesn't. I mean, it matters when you're here, but when you're, when it's checkout time, man, like it, it doesn't matter. No. I, I, dude, I love this. I love this. So, so in your mid thirties to late thirties, you went, uh, just a side note, five and a half year divorce. That is yeah. a long time to get a divorce. Yeah, that was actually later. Um, I got married in my, I didn't get married until oh. I was 37. So yeah, oh, wow. uh, that was, uh, uh, um, that was a few. Yeah. yeah it, and it only ended because I just, I found out I had cancer and uh, uh, I, I was, uh, I, I just couldn't keep going. And so I just walked away and just said, take everything, literally just both houses, all of it. The retirement, everything. I just said, I'm done. And uh, I, I got it, you know, life. for everybody watching that just may have joined, Mark is 65 years old. Unbelievable. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Like, you don't, you're not, like, you don't look remotely close to 65. That's insane to me. Oh, well. You, you haven't seen me try to hike one of those mountains we were talking about in Hawaii. <laughs> I just got back from Kauai and that <laughs> I felt 65, believe me. <laughs> oh my God. So, so, okay. So you went through, so you didn't get married until you were 37. Wow. Um, yeah. So my, my wife says, no way. Um, it, oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah, Debbie <laughs> yeah. says, Fountain of Youth location, please. <laughs> He's from Flint, Michigan. It's the water. It's the water in Flint. So, um, I love that. Yeah. so, so, um, I do have a program actually called uh, Limitless Aging, and it's the art and science of aging magnificently. And there really? are things that we can do. So, yeah, it's, um, I just, in fact, did a podcast uh, for a, a uh, a site called Manopause, which is pretty cool. It's for men ages that. 50 and older, manopause.com. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I did a program. It's in fact, they just posted it. So a, so the art and science of aging magnificently. So I do talk about, about it and they're definitely mindset does play a role. Yes. And, does. um, you know, and having a really nice, um, you know, evening skincare regime. I'm kidding. <laughs> my wife says tell us where to find that course i have a feeling she's getting ready to spend some money um <laughs> no no we'll we'll definitely put your links up so so yeah, so great. go back to your mid-30s so you hadn't really 
at that point you hadn't made it made it financially and all the other stuff yeah oh yeah um, oh um, okay. i had already won my emmy awards and i was living oh. in paradise valley arizona geez i moved there when i was still in my 20s which is you know that's the bel air of arizona yeah. and, and so um i i know i had a pretty good life and continued oh. to do so well into my 40s but it was never enough uh, we just kept on getting more and more and I realized in that process, oh my gosh, it won't matter. I mean, I've won the awards, I've got the accolades, I've got, and I started doing a lot of nonprofit work. Um, uh, child abuse started, in, in, and that was clear back in 84, I did my first uh, child abuse uh, campaign to raise money and help build more beds and so on. And then it grew from the Child Crisis Center to Child Help USA to United Way, United Cerebral Palsy, uh, Red Cross, uh, uh, you name the nonprofit, Child Help, or, I mean, uh, Make-A-Wish, you name them. And I created their campaigns, almost uh, wow. all the top, probably 50. And there's not a lot of money in that, <laughs> by the way. Uh, yeah, right. I've always but wondered. I felt that. like my life suddenly really started to mean something. And so I started transitioning at that point from it's all about making money to no, it's about making a difference. It's about making my life meaningful. And, uh, and, uh, and so that didn't go over well with, with those who are uh, counting on me to make tons and tons of money, but I'd already been there and said, this isn't fulfilling for me any longer. And so I, the transition started before the divorce. In fact, it triggered some of the divorce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you don't so, need to go into a lot of detail there you figure you could connect uh, those yeah. dots fill, fill in the blanks i get it so 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 mark talk about the um let's back up a little bit i was on uh glenn morshower's acting class last night and i i said yeah, and it was late it was late 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 and there's like another really famous actor on there and some other and, and so I'm, I, I send Glenn a private message in the Zoom and I said, dude, I have to go. I have a three time Emmy award winning filmmaker on my show tomorrow. And, and he, he replies back. He says, so what you're saying is I'm not welcome back until I win three Emmys. <laughs> I said, dude. but I, I do want to back up to that a little bit. I, I want to talk about the, the, um, because I realize that's not the direction of your life necessarily today. It's still an unbelievable accomplishment. So, so talk about the three Emmys and what they were for and, and how you even achieved it and what it made you feel in the moment of achieving that. Oh, thank you. Uh, I would say uh, that probably the most important thing is um, the awards are a, a, a source of validation to somebody who has, uh, who's in the business and really knows knows their their business. They um, it just happens that that the film and television industry happens to give awards to people who their peers. Uh, look up to. Uh, but, you know, I mean, there are lots of folks out there who are in, you know, plumbers, and, you know, and contractors and uh, right. uh, Uber drivers, but they don't give awards to Uber drivers. Right. So, you know, so I put it in perspective and I realized that <clears throat> that what all that's really happening is um, I put something out there that I believe in and we I've just found people who agree with me where I'm saying, I believe in this product, I think that it's good, and I'm going to put it out there. And uh, and hopefully, uh, others will will agree only in as much as the fact that I want to influence them. And, and so they don't have the same impact on me as they might someone who is still developing their sense of self and uh, trying to build a, the, the security and the self-worth, at, at which point it would be highly validating. Um, yeah. So uh, in each case, uh, in any time I've won an award, uh, I already knew what I had. Uh, it didn't mean that the world would agree with me. There are plenty of directors who will say my best film was boom. And it may be something you've never even heard of. It may right. have been a box flop, but they stand by their film and say, this is the proudest work I've ever done. Yeah. And, and so 
you know, what I teach is if you want, if you don't want the opinions of others to negatively impact you, if you don't want to spend your whole life desperately attempting to get the world to tell you that you're okay, the only solution is, of course, you've got to look in the mirror and say, I'm okay. I'm not perfect. No one is. And that's okay. I'm enough. I, I'm doing the best that I can with what I have, and that's enough. And, and, and But what comes with that is, and this is the, the great paradox, is if you want to get to a point where the negative opinions of people don't have a big impact on you, you have to get to the place where the positive opinions don't have a big impact on you either. See, you right. can't have it both ways. As That's long as you right. need their accolades, you'll continue to be affected by their uh, uh, criticisms and so on. And, and so it's kind of like you get to this place where it's, um, thank you for your contributions to me, whether they're positive or negative. I All input is good. So if you tell me you don't like what I've done, thank you. Help me understand why so I can make it better, so I can do better. If you do like, help me understand why so I can do more of that. And that's all the awards mean to me now is just, wow. okay, so somebody says I got that one right. I'll do more, do it this way more often. But boy, I'm just as happy to have somebody say, preferably not in front of the whole world. You know, I don't <laughs> think you did that right. <laughs> so what you're saying is you, you do have a brand to protect. Him. You're yes, tell me the good stuff in front of everyone, but the de the dark stuff, you know, whisper it to me and I'll be fine. <laughs> oh my God, that's too funny. You're still affected by other people's opinions is what you're saying. Even after it's hitting your levels of enlightenment, everybody is. I mean, I, I think that- um, I'm working on it. <laughs> Mother Teresa probably was like, what did you just say? So, so you know- um, I love that answer. So you, you're not going to go into details about your Emmys is what you're trying to say. <laughs> well, I, I think we could probably use this time to contribute more to folks than, you know, something that they it. can get on, you know, the, the entertainment channel. Um, <laughs> and, and by the way, I certainly would. I mean, I'd have yeah, uh, sure. just respect for you as an interviewer. You yeah, certainly yeah. know what your audience wants to hear. Yeah. And, and I can say, yeah. you know, it's fun. And, uh, yeah. and, and it's, uh, you know, it's a great party and you're the star and that's kind of cool. <laughs> I think, I think what I, what, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, I mean, I'm selfish this way. It's, it's more about what I want to know than what the audience, <laughs> that's terrible. I'm just kidding. Don't leave. I'm playing. So no, that makes um, you a great interviewer. If you happen to have a lot in common with your audience, then you're going to ask yeah. the questions they would ask. That's so right. yeah, if you have a specific question about Emmy Awards, I can be happy to I, tell I think you. <laughs> from my perspective, it's more about, you know, I, I mean, we're all out here in this world. I, I always say, look, nobody has it all figured out. Like nobody. And, and if they tell no. you that they do, they'll lie to you about other shit too. So even like, Wayne Dyer on, on camera, when he found out that he was voted, did you ever see that interview where they said Which that one? the most spiritual people in the world, it was um, Eckhart Tolle, followed yeah. by the Dalai Lama, followed by Wayne Dyer. Uh, the Dalai Lama was not in the interview, but Eckhart and De Wayne were. Yeah. He spent the entire interview um, basically showing that he was upset that he was number three. <laughs> and he was a pretty amazing guy, but his <laughs> ego was still right there, front and center. There you go. Like, uh, I don't know I, how I, they, what, what criteria did they use to decide which one of us was number three? <laughs> I know. I, you know, if I made it into the top 10,000, I'd be like, wow, really? Um, but, you know, I think it, it's more about what it, it takes to, because look, to win an Emmy or win any award or, achieve levels of, of, of success or fame or whatever, it takes a certain mindset. It takes certain actions. It takes, you know, and, and I think that people it's are called OCD. Really? It, it's called OCD. <laughs> when, when everybody says that's fine, we got the shot and you go, no, I know I can do better. I know I can do this better. Or there's they like the editor wants to go home. It's three o'clock in the morning. You go, no, man, there, you know, that there, there's a flash frame in there. I just know it. I can feel it. We have to go back and recut that. Wow. <laughs> really? It does play a role. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I know yeah. I can do better. 
so that obsession obsession yeah. just being obsessed yeah, obsession plays a role it, there's no question yeah. about it yeah so so you had this shift what how old were you when you had this this sudden shift in well not sudden five and a half year divorce is definitely not sudden um but you had a shift a, a change um how about what age were you and what I, what are i was in my early you? 40s okay when it started uh and uh it's just by then i you know i had everything i had sort of passed my wildest dreams in terms of the lifestyle and yeah. um and i could pretty much do anything i wanted and uh and realized that uh what i wanted was a different life <laughs> I wanted to spend my life creating a better world. And I, I think that that's probably common once you reach a level of, you know, and of course, enlightenment is a never ending quest. There's the, you know, empowerment, uh, the empowerment part was there. I could influence the world around me easily. The enlightenment part, as I was growing in that field, uh, I found that, uh, in fact, it kind of validated uh, my favorite holiday is Thanksgiving because those two words will give you the, the, the secret to a fulfilling life, thanks, which is living a state in a state of gratitude and giving, which is a state of contribution and selfless service. And, and wow. so the gratitude was there. Um, but again, homeostasis, you get used to it. And it's like, you know, uh, you know, it's a nice house, but, you know, I can never find the kids. It's 11,000 square feet. Where the hell are my kids now? And, you know, so you're wandering around. There's always something. Uh, yeah. and, and so as I was working on that end of it, um, the, the big thing was the contribution. And I found that such tremendous um, fulfillment and meaning and purpose in this, uh, the idea of being able to make a difference. And for some people, it's, it's a difference in the life of one or two people. And in my case, because I was involved in media and I was, uh, had influence and I stood on stages and so on, I thought, I can make a much bigger difference than the one I'm making. Kind of like at the end of Schindler's List, when they give him the ring that they made out of uh, their, their fillings from their teeth. And all he could say was, I could have done so much more. And, and yeah. that's a big thing for me is, uh, is teaching myself and others how to live and die without regrets. And of course, you, mm. you've heard, I'm sure, many times, we don't regret the things we did, but as often as the things we didn't do. And, right. and so... That shift happened to me in my 40s to the idea that I don't want to have regrets over over um, a life half lived. I know I can do more. And by the end of my divorce, which didn't happen until that was in my 50s before the divorce began and wow. uh, concluded, um, by then I was completely transitioned. Wow. This sounds like a, um, this, I mean, it really, it sounds like, a, a, um, the Eckhart Tolle, the, the power of, of now yeah. like, he talks about sleeping on park benches and like, I'm like, Dude, yes, he I, I know yes, it's he, like, there's like, a, there's quite a few who've been hit rock bottom. Uh, um, Byron Katie, uh, yeah. yes. Yeah. That when you, uh, enlightened, human beings it's so it's kind of like i wouldn't wish it on anyone and yet i wish everyone could experience the things that byron katie did i did that uh that that um eckhart tolle did where you hit rock bottom and suddenly you say oh my gosh so that's as this is kind of like as bad as it gets well all right then what am i afraid of so i've seen it i i've survived my worst my greatest fears and and once you can start living your life without the fear uh you know you're still afraid of uh, of jumping off uh, you know high buildings but you're not right. as afraid yeah. of the abstract things in life you say you know what whatever happens i'll be okay it's like the kid who uh you want to teach self-confidence to your kid don't teach him how to hit home runs every time teach him how to how to feel okay when he strikes out Right, because you can do a lot more of that. Exactly. <laughs> oh God, that's powerful, man. That's so powerful. Oh my God, because that is the big. I I think about my kids and like you, you just like you want them to have that feeling of exhilaration when they win, but 
you know, unfortunately, you have to also like they have to lose. That's that's part of life. And then you teach them there's no such thing as losing by the definition. My definition of losing is the fail is the absence of growth. And you say, mm -hmm. no, wait a minute. It's I, I, I do an event called, you know, failing your way to the top. And it's, uh, you know, it's the, the saying in uh, uh, in California in uh, is uh, fail often, uh, fail fast, fail, fail often, fail fast. So hurry up and get the failures over with so you can learn the lesson so you can move on. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, yeah, once you get to the idea that there is no failure, unless you really, truly have a, a fixed mindset and refuse to learn a thing from it and just want to be a victim, then I guess you can experience the feeling of failure. I haven't experienced that in years and years. No matter what happens, whether it turns out the way I planned or not, um, I'm looking at it and saying, okay, what can I learn from this? How can I take this and, and use it? And, and, and you find, yeah, that that can. So you want your kids to learn how to fail well, fail yeah. beautifully, magnificently. I, 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 you've used the word, and since you continue using it, we're going to talk about it. You, you keep using the word victim. That's like the fourth time I've heard you say victim. And I, 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 I preach this myself. Um, yeah. <clears throat> there are, how do I word this? There are professional victims in life. <laughs> there are people who, and, and, and they don't, they don't even realize it. Right. How do you, how do you, um, how do you shift someone from having that victim mentality to, to, to the other side? Um, how do you get them to wake up and go, Oh, because I did, I, I, I did. I remember like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I guess, I guess maybe I have been a victim my, my whole life. So how do you yeah. get somebody to wake up to that? Or can you? Yeah. It's uh, yes. Yes, you can. And it's a great question also, Ken, because, uh, a, a much larger percentage of the population lives in a victim. I call it a mindset, a victim mindset. Yeah. And a mindset is, uh, is, you know, much bigger than an attitude. An attitude, you can change your attitude in five seconds. You can have a good attitude, a bad attitude, uh, yeah. you know, up, up and down and so on. But a mindset, that's kind of the ocean that your ship is floating on. And, uh, and that, um, uh, you can have more than one mindset. And, um, in fact, I have multiple mindsets. In fact, I teach about that. Uh, there's a there's a limitless mindset. There's an opportunity mindset, a gratitude mindset, and so on. And then there's the victim mindset. And the victim mindset is basically, um, it's this isn't fair, right? This is not fair. And um, the first thing I talk to them about is I say, so how does it feel when you think the thought that this isn't fair? And of course they say, well, it makes me upset. I say exactly. So. That's a thought that you've chosen to think about and you've chosen to focus on. But let me tell you something. What if um, what if life isn't fair? What if life is difficult? And you already know that because you've been alive for so many years. What if yeah. life isn't fair? In fact, I can prove it to you. If life were fair, would children be born um, uh, uh, with deformities or disease? Would, would some people be born in wealthy countries and others born in poverty-stricken countries, third, third world nations, and so on. Life isn't fair. So what's your point? And right. suddenly they start, you know, it's, it's like an eye-opener. Okay, so now that you've accepted that life is difficult and life isn't fair, how about if we get on with our life? Because every time you think the thought, this isn't fair, it upsets you and it compromises your quality of life. Now, you don't just stop thinking it. What you do is you replace it. I, I, one of my books is called Self Help Me, Change Your Habits, Change Your Life. And I teach the way you get rid of a habit isn't by just unhabiting it, it's by replacing <laughs> it with a better habit. Because right. a habit is already hardwired into your brain. Right. And so you replace it by giving it a different, uh, a different course to follow, uh, a different pathway to get to wherever you wanna be until this yeah finally stops being fed and then the habit dies out on its own. And so uh, your mindsets can be transitioned sim similarly. So um, the victim mindset, what's the opposite of a victim mindset? Uh, so Ken, you are definitely an enlightened guy. What would you think might be 
mindsets that would be the opposite of a victim mindset. If a victim mindset is, this isn't fair, it's not enough, it's not good enough, what would be the opposite of that? You're you're talking to somebody with 20 years of sobriety and recovery. So um, the, it's it comes from that book right there by Jack Canfield and Janet Switzer. The very first principle in the success principles is take 100% responsibility for everything in your life. So the opposite of a victim mindset, in my opinion, is a responsibility mindset. Love it. Oh, my gosh. You are the first person who has ever answered that question with that word. And Boom! Do I win a six-car garage house? <laughs> <laughs> How about a free coaching session, man? Because that was good stuff. The it's responsibility good, mindset is huge. And what's even bigger, you know this, but uh, some of our uh, viewing audience uh, may not realize why it's so huge. Responsibility. We think of that as as a negative word for the most part. Think about it. You're growing up. Who's responsible for this mess? They call right. your know, dad yells at you and, you know, right. blah, blah, blah. I didn't right. do it. The dog did it. Or, you know, doing the dishes is your responsibility. We think yeah. of it as a heart, as a, it's a, not a good word, but break it apart. What you have is response ability, ability. the ability yeah. to respond. Oh my gosh, that's a gift. I have the ability to respond. Uh, yeah. Think about somebody who has ALS, somebody who has, um, I used to use the example of Christopher Reeve when he was still alive. I mean, what he would give to be able to, his nose itched. You can't respond. You can't itch, scratch your own nose when you're paralyzed from the neck down. You can't respond. Mm -hmm. They give anything to be able to respond. And so when you grasp it and say responsibility, so that means that I can do something about it. Oh, so when you claim, I call it claiming, like you're staking a claim in the ground. Um, yeah. When you claim responsibility for your life, that means that you have the ability to do something about it. It's like a victim blames. Yeah. So let's think about your, your next door neighbor is doing something that you don't like. And you say, it's my next door neighbor's fault for all these things. And he's a jerk and he's an idiot. And it's he's the reason why I hate living here. So you just gave all of your power to your number one enemy. Well, that doesn't sound very strategic. That's not what I want to do. I, he's the last guy I want to give my power to, right? Right, right. He's giving me power. Now he is, gets to decide whether you have a good life or not. So what's wow. the opposite of that is, hey, I can decide what I want to do about this. And I can make it my, my quest in life is to be amazing at finding ways to capitalize on all the things that everybody else sees as problems. What do you think Elon Musk is doing? He looks at something that everybody says, well, that's a problem, and nobody knows how to fix it. And he goes, well, if I fix that problem, then I, oh, I get $100 billion. Oh, well, there's another <laughs> right. one. Hey, there's, I could use an, another $100 billion just in case Twitter goes south. Oh, oh right. I could use another 100 So <laughs> that's an opportunity mindset. So now you can start with your responsibility mindset. Yeah, you're able to do something about it and now add an opportunity mindset. And how about a gratitude mindset? Instead of complaining about what I don't have, the things that are not fair. Well, how about this? What is fair? What? Because the world isn't fair, which means that you got a few things that you didn't want. Did you get anything you do want? Do you Can you see? Can you walk and talk? Can you move? Do you have food in your refrigerator? Do you have someone who loves you? There are for every one thing you can think of that isn't fair in the dark side. Well, there's at least one that's that isn't fair on the bright side. It's Amen. like you got more than the rest of the world in this area. So those things combined start to change the way you see things. And ultimately, the victim mindset fades away and it's replaced by someone taking responsibility for their life and looking at all the blessings and all the things that they have and then. So on, and, and of course, looking for the opportunities and situations that would make somebody else turn someone else into a victim. Great questions. This wow. Is that, 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 uh, wow. I mean, I, we don't know each other that well. I have a feeling we're going yeah. to get to know each other, but, um, you know, I, I do, I've done over 3000 live streams and, and I've, I've, wow. 
I'll bet you 50% of them have been preaching to people about stop being a victim. One, one of my, one of my favorite things is, is Grant Cardone sells these on his website. I got to show it. I got to show it. I love this bracelet. I've actually given, I've given this bracelet. I had a jar full of them. This is my last one. I need to get some more. But this, I've given this bracelet to problem clients in the past. <laughs> Tell me a little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I, I sometimes I'll put that on because look, we all, and I think you'll agree, we all have this, this, um, I call it the devil and the angel. We all have this, this, we, we can quickly slip into a victim mindset, right? So sometimes if I'm feeling victimized or I'm, I'm pissed off or I'm whatever, and I know it always goes back to something I'm not taking responsibility for. And, and yeah. so if I, if I put that on, it just reminds me not to be one, not to be, not to be that. So I, I think that, that what you just said, man, is it, it's incredible. Absolutely incredible. My wife, my wife just said, the world needs this. Everyone should hear this message. So amazing. This is amazing. Thank you, Jim. I, so, I hope to meet you one day as well. Well, you're just, right now, you're right up the road from us. So we're in Ohio. We're in Ohio. Um, oh, we won't talk about college football then. You go, but <laughs> so, um, <laughs> hey, hey, everybody has to have haters. So, and there's a legend right there, Ben Gay the third. Ben, good to see you, man. Um, hey, <laughs> so, so, Mark, um, I can't even believe we've been on here 56 minutes already. Wow. Okay. So, let me ask you this question. I, I have a feeling I know where you're going to go with it, but the number one answer to this is fear and I, I that you have to do better. <laughs> so, so the, the question is this, what do, in your opinion, what do you think holds people back in life from two things? Number one, real financial success. Um, and number two, freedom, and, and I do think they're related because I've been homeless, sleeping in my car and broke. And I've been what wealthy. What kind of car was it? It what was a, um, it was a Ford. Um, uh, 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 what is that? You asked me too fast. Ask me slower. <laughs> Here, I'll tell a you, mine, mine, was a, mine was a four-door Buick LeSabre. Oh, like my gosh. Five. So they're very roomy. <laughs> mine was not roomy it was a compact it was a subcompact car it was a ford um not a mustang the escort ford escort oh. gt <laughs> yeah it was it nice was it had a at and it was in seattle so it, the weather was not terrible um so so but you know when i what do you think stops people from achieving financial success and real freedom and happiness in life? Big question, uh, man. Yeah, it's a great question. I'll, I'll make it short because I know we're at our, at the tail end of our interview. No, we, Hey, it's at, look, I always say this, it's my show and it's the internet. We can go all day if we need to, but I, you, I do. You like tell, I, I've been trained yeah. in traditional media. I, I know. Yeah, it's the we've got our here. outro at uh, fifty nine thirty, so that they've got a thirty second uh, <laughs> segue into the next show. John John uh, John Gray was on for an hour and thirty two minutes, so it's okay. Whatever. Well, I'm whatever. not surprised. Yeah. I thought I was loquacious. Uh, John <laughs> never runs out of anything to say. He's 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 amazing, he's and he amazing. talks a little more slowly than I do, so he, he needs more time. <laughs> <laughs> he's a great oh, guy he's, so he's awesome. amazing yeah so um so i i'm going to tell you uh something that uh first of all uh, you know anyone who says they have the one and only answer uh yeah probably is um is is limiting uh the the possibilities but there are certainly there, there's more than one reason for why people are not as successful as they could be and, and some of it is circumstantial. Some of it is uh, uh, such as, you know, where they were born, when they were born. Uh, they, there are things that can influence them, but the truly successful individuals 
uh, have certain things in common. And, and in fact, there was a, a study uh, in regard to um, uh, the most successful people uh, in virtually all walks of life. And I've heard different numbers. The biggest I heard was they studied 10,000 different people who were the top in the, the, the top of their field and everything from uh, from, from the sports, arts, uh, uh, money makers, uh, uh, you know, the teacher of the year award. I mean, the best teachers, the best of everything, trying to find out if there was a common denominator. And they made a little list of what they thought their, um, uh, was behind their success. There was only one thing that they all had in common. And uh, in a word, uh, perseverance. They, mm. some of them were not that bright. Some of them were not that attractive or not that tall or not that healthy. Or there wasn't, it wasn't that, you know, tall, healthy, white males, you know, it wasn't that thing. It was right. anyone from any race, from any field and so on. Those folks uh, uh, had a lot of different things going for them, but ultimately it came down to perseverance. And that's as far as the study went. And folks, uh, I've seen people teach on the, the, the power of perseverance. But I broke it down further and said, well, wait a minute. Why do some people persevere? I wanted to go deeper. And it came down to something very simple. Belief. If you don't believe that it's going to happen, if you don't believe you're capable, if you don't believe it's possible, you will not persevere. You may try. You may start. You may, you know, as Yoda said, you know, there is no try. <laughs> you know, there's, there's no yeah. right. Well, what he was teaching is. Belief. They don't break that down, but think about it. There's no try. Try means that you don't believe. Do you try to breathe in the morning? Do you try to, you know, it's, it's, you believe that there will be oxygen. Uh, you don't hope that there will be oxygen. You believe there will be. In fact, when it comes to oxygen, you know there will be. So I break it into three air. Uh, somebody commented on my yoga. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I just came off of a state that was very sweet, but I actually do a great Yoda, but not now. I've lost my voice. I, I just did a whole series of seminars. I'm starting to sound too much like Tony Robbins. Only <laughs> <laughs> oh, he has bigger teeth than me. <laughs> he's like, like a little taller. Eight foot yeah, tall. Yeah. I'm six two and he's towers over me. <laughs> I know. He's huge. Wow. He's, yeah, he's six eight, I think. But anyhow, I did have a good Yoda at one point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's hope, belief, and no. Interest. I love to take words and, and break it down and ask the question, is that a good word or a bad word? We think hope is a great word, but the truth is hope means you don't believe. You don't hope mm -hmm. there will be gravity when you wake up. You don't hope that you won't wake up floating uh, against the ceiling. You know, I mean, right. I mean you know, you, you know that there will be gravity. You don't hope. I mean, I won't go into Detail, but imagine the space it, uh, on the space station. You know, when they use the bathroom and there's no gravity, that's a complicated thing. Imagine here on Earth if we didn't have gravity, just going to the bathroom would be a hell of a problem. So, in another thing, we don't appreciate like we could. So, I say, you want to replace? I know that was way too graphic. <laughs> no, I'm like, I, yeah, I'm you can't unsee that. Yeah. So, we want to replace our hope with our as well as our fear. So there's fear, hope, believe, no. And so, yeah, fear is getting in the way. Um, we hope that the thing won't happen that we're afraid of. But once you get to the point where you believe it won't happen, it's like a superpower because now you'll you'll stick with it. You'll try things. And the only difference between believe and no is once you've done the thing you believe long enough, you have enough effort. I, I mean, enough uh, evidence that you finally say, well, now I know. And so that's my 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 goal in terms of helping people get to wherever they want to be is getting them to the no. And and so it's got to start with how can I prove to myself that I can do this? And it can sometimes be baby steps. Take that thing on that you're not quite sure of and find some version that you can do. And you do it and you lament in that and you say, OK, now I've got this one. And if I did that, then I can do this. A big piece, which is what I love about your show, is find somebody else who did it. Breakthrough walls. I love that because you're not, it doesn't say silver spoon. It's not like, oh, I'm going to interview only people who were born with everything and hadn't, didn't have to do a thing to get there. 
Right. That, that doesn't yeah. inspire me. I can't learn anything from that. Tell me about people who lived in cars and who have had uh, overcame cancer and 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 geez, they they um, diagnosed me with uh, ALS, and uh, I went for an entire week believing, thinking that I had ALS, and they, they had did? to come back a week later. Yeah, yeah, I've got this crazy neuromuscular thing, and it imitates ALS, but it's so rare that they just assumed it has to be ALS because it was every symptom. And uh, they said, we'll run the test again in a week. We're going to do some more things. Um, but the EMS tests, they're horrible tests. They stick these needles into your muscles and send electricity through your body and into your into your, your nerves. And, oh, my God, and you have to be awake for it. And I had to go back well, a like week I later. Didn't have it. I didn't even have it until they did the tests. And now yeah. Like what the heck, jeez. So, so, but I will tell you this: talk about uh, you know breakthrough people who have endured. Um, again, it's not. I wouldn't wish it on anyone. By the same token, I wish that everyone could hit rock bottom. I wish everyone could think for a week that they have ALS and be figuring out whether they're going to try to survive the two years uh, and then have the things put in and not be able to move. Uh, for the rest of their life, or am I just going to commit you to euthanize myself and just be done? So, yeah. so, oh, so sorry. Let me stop that. There we go. Uh, <laughs> I, I know that not much of a pro. I didn't turn my phone off before our <laughs> interview. Um, but literally, how many people reach that level of an ex existential crisis in terms of? So, will I spend the rest of my life unable to move anything but my eyes and have that life, or? Will I just let this thing run its course? And I don't know, maybe in a year from now, right, you know, right when I'm no longer able to do certain things, then I end my life. And I got to figure that out during that week. Uh, and then, of course, when it turned out that I didn't have it, um, that was the last massive life change that I had was at this point, no matter what happens, it's not ALS. It's not ALS. Right. I don't care what happens. I used to say it's not a brain tumor. If I had a brain tumor, I'd go, it's not ALS. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> oh, so, you know, so so we want to relate to people who had things like that, who had a hard time, who had issues and still come through on the other side, not just found a way to make a lot of money, but much better found a way to make, to create an amazing life. That's yes. what we did. That, that's what, what we need to see. And so, it's one of the secrets to getting to, to that successful place is find people who've had challenges that are similar to yours and they made it, that they made it, I can make it. Yeah. And, 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 and so building the belief is the antithesis of fear. So I hope that gave you at least one scenario in terms of how to get to where you, you want to be. And, you know, and then I'm big on moonshots. I'm really big on setting your moonshots and having something to aim for something huge. I, I totally agree. This has been a, an unbelievable interview. I, I, I think it, I'm going to, I'm, we're a little bit over. Hopefully you don't mind. Um, sounds like unknown callers trying to get a hold of you. Um, but <laughs> but right. I, that happens about 20 times a day. <laughs> I know. It's like, I'm not answering an unknown caller, you idiots. Um, so, so, <laughs> One last question, and, and, and I, yeah. my wife and I started our first office. She's she's got thirty years of marketing experience on a global scale, and I me wow. too. And and so we I need one got, of those. Yeah, right. <laughs> I know. She, trust me. I'm like, well, could you please explain message. that so I can understand it? Because yeah, like, no she, kidding. She talks up up here, but but so you know, we started our first office. I don't know, 12 years ago or whatever, right after we, 13 years ago, it was right after we met and we had a handful of employees and, and, and one day this guy, I'm on the phone, this, this big old boy that worked for me walks in. He's like, Hey, um, there's a, there's a dude in the parking lot looking in the windows of your SUV. And I'm sitting here going, why are you telling me go, you're bigger than me. Go kick his ass. I mean, get him out of here. What? He's like, he's got it blocked with a tow truck. I'm like, oh, uh, no, no, this isn't happening. I got to go. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, everybody was getting paid except for us. And, and so I remember when I'm standing in the parking lot, watching my car be towed away on a flatbed in front of all my employees. And it was literally oh, yeah. like one of the worst moments of my life, man. I'm like, son of a, that's going to leave a mark. And, and, oh. and so, so I was like, I remember feeling like life sucks. What's the point of living and going on? And w w this is bull crap and all of the stuff. Right. And, and, and for the people who are watching that, that may be at that place where they're hanging on by a thread, they don't know that, you know, I love Tony Robbins talks about when somebody says they've tried everything and I'm like, really, you've tried everything, but like, you know, they feel like they've tried everything and their business isn't working or things just aren't working out. They don't, they can't afford a Mark or a Ken. They can't, they can't pay a coach to, to help. Like, what do you say to that person to help them get through that horrible moment and, and know that things are going to be okay? Oh, I love that. Another great question. And and I obviously run into that uh, frequently enough. Um, you begin by helping them understand just the nature of reality and um, that what they're experiencing, when you break it down, it's an interpretation. They are looking at the world around them and they're interpreting it. And they're interpreting it in, in a way that causes them uh, pain, frustration, fear, um, uh, whatever, whatever they're going through at that moment. It's not the thing that happened, uh, that's causing them all that pain. It's, it's how they're, uh, how they're looking at it and what they're focusing on. Uh, and, and so, um, I, my definition of, of reality is a story that you believe. So it takes us back to the power of belief. And that's one of my events. In fact, it's called the power of belief. And so if you so so what I do is I have them tell me their story. And by the time they finished mm. uh, telling me what their story is, uh, that, you know, life isn't fair and so on and so forth, then we break the story down. And I ask them, does that story serve you? How does it make you feel? And we talked about that earlier. And of course, they say it's terrible. I hate being here. I don't want to feel this way. And right. I say, all right, then help me, help me punch holes in this story, because I guarantee you, there's an infinite number of stories about everything and anything. You've chosen one that doesn't serve you. And let's see if we can come up with some other stories that are equally plausible. See, you've chosen a story, and now you're looking at for proof that that story is true. And Goethe wrote, we see what we're looking for. And so you'll find some proof that this story is true, that, uh, that your life sucks or whatever it may be. Um, but I'd like you to, once again, it's like, how do you get rid of a habit? You replace it with a different habit. So how do you get rid of a story that doesn't serve you is replace it with a story that does. So um, now I'm not saying an, an implausible story. Write a story that could be true. And I help them do that in that case. And so once they start writing stories that uh, that would serve them, that would make them feel better, then we start looking for proof that that story is true. And we we find it, and um, and and as they start to to believe in a new story, their reality shifts, and I call it being on the dark train when they're in that dark space, and so we shift them onto the bright train, and what happens is we're just changing the filter, so you've got the dark train, you've got the filter that's saying problem, 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 and you replaced it with opportunity, opportunity. So there's a problem filter, opportunity filter, and what is the difference? I mean, there's uh, an opportunity is just a problem that somebody decided to do something with, uh, take advantage of, uh, instead of something that they decided to hide behind and be a victim to it. So uh, once they start to move into this, the, and, and it's a great, powerful place to be, to ex recognize that this story that doesn't serve me may be just a half-truth. But that means that these other stories also have just as much potential. I tell people, you know, you always look, you look at the worst case scenario and freak out. Well, at the very least, give best case scenario, e scenario equal time. Doesn't, Thank isn't you. That fair? 
Give me, well, what's the best case scenario? And it'll probably be somewhere in the middle, which isn't nearly as disastrous as you may think. And, wow. and so I'll, I'll finish with this simple thing that often happens when some when I'm teaching somebody, just replace this with a story that make, that does serve you. And they're going, well, you're just telling me to make up a story. You're telling me to live in a fantasy world. And I smile and say, you already do. You just don't realize it. <laughs> yes. 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 That's so true. God, that's true. I'm just turning you into the writer of your fantasy instead of the victim of your fantasy. You wow. didn't just read this story. You wrote it. Now let's get good at that. Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, school's out. <laughs> that, wow. That was incredible. Mark, you are freaking unbelievable, man. Well, wow. You're fine. Thank you, Ken. This, you know, this was my first podcast. How'd I do? <laughs> I'm kidding. It was my third. <laughs> I, I think there might be a future in it for you. Yeah, I, I decided it's time to start doing podcasts, but um, I, I'm I think I'm gonna enjoy them. <laughs> you're you're um, you're a great you're fun to interview. You're you're filled with so much wisdom and um I'm I'm so grateful. So um thank you to Melody Meyer for for introducing us. Yeah, and you, um and we know yeah. Mark Victor Hansen would have eventually <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I think, Mark, you're not sitting around wondering who you could refer to me to be on my show. What, what, why, why you act so busy? <laughs> I know, the damnedest thing. You, um, I get my phone call, and it'll be like five in the morning. Mark, have you been thinking about this? I can't stop thinking about it. What do you think we should do? Do you think you could have it ready by eight? Eight what? I know. This morning. I'm like, I know. <laughs> Good morning, <laughs> yeah. Mark. <laughs> yeah, right. You, know, you were my alarm clock, but thank you. So, hey, listen. Uh, hey, by the way, how? Let me put this up on screen. How can? What's your website address? What? What? Oh, yeah, where can everybody really find remember, out more? The, well, you can see it right back there. That's it. TheLimitlessCoach.com. That's it. Dude, that's TheLimitlessCoach.com. Coach, I'm typing it out. Dot com um is that it right there that's it okay it's like you spell so it right is now that you where think. your programs are everything for people to to follow you and buy from you and all of that yes yeah okay all right you're amazing people love love you look at all these and it's it's mainly women oh. <laughs> i'm kidding oh. <laughs> no, i'm kidding I'm kidding. No, you're 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 amazing. So, Mark, thank you for coming on and and spending some extra time with us today, sharing your wisdom. Thank you to everybody who's watched. If if you have not shared this out, normally I would call you selfish, but I understand. So, share this out, and there will be great rewards for you in your very near future just by sharing. So, wow. um, thank you, thank you're you so kind, much. Ken. And, and I thank appreciate you. you. And, and I will say my only plug is uh, my favorite course of all is my life mastery course. And that's on the site. Uh, and it's a it's a 12 week course that's followed by another and another for however long you want to work on mastering your life. So that's the thing wow. I'm probably the most proud of. But thank you so much for having me on, Ken. I, so I, incredible, man. I believe we will stay in touch. I know we will. And I have your cell phone number now, so I'm going to stop. I can run, but I can't hide. <laughs> right. I'll be the unknown caller every day. For <laughs> so thank you, guys. Appreciate all of you. Mark, I really appreciate you. Um, my wife wants to know where we can. Where? Yeah, what's the best social media platform to follow you on? Well, uh, you know, that's the other thing about the podcast. I just started launching social media because uh, it's so much business from word of mouth. Uh, seminars yeah. and coaching and so on. But once I decided, okay, it's time now, I want to reach the world. Uh, and so we just launched it, but we just launched a Facebook and an Instagram and uh, LinkedIn and YouTube. Uh, so uh, those things are, yeah, and we're starting to populate them. This will go on, this will go up immediately. Uh, okay. and, uh, and so uh, Facebook's probably the only, uh, the most robust uh, of them at this point. Uh, okay. But um, 
my new social media team, I'm sure will come and up with all sorts the, of things. What's the, is it the limitless coach? Oh yeah, Mark Fournier. Oh, Mark Fournier. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, Keep so follow simple. Mark everywhere, everywhere. And if you can't yeah. find him, let him know he needs to be there. That's great. Yeah. My Instagram is just Mark Fournier. Okay. So you can remember uh, how to spell it. You're, you're there. F O U R N I E R Mark Fournier. Mark, you're awesome, man. Thank you so much. You're and everybody down. go ahead and share. Even if you've already shared it, share it again. Mark, have a great day. Stay with me though. Everybody else have a great day as well. And we will see you later. Thanks so much, Mark. Thank you. Bye-bye.